Oh. Welcome to the University of Michigan Student to Student Discussion today, and we're really pleased to have you join us. My name is Paula Wishart, and I work here at Rackham Graduate School, and I'll be moderating the panel today. Joining me today are six current Michigan students who will share their insights with you on the transition to U of M. Also joining is Natalie Bartolacci, who will be moderating the questions you send us online, and you can send a question anytime. And let me let Natalie introduce herself. Hi, I'm Natalie Bartolacci, and I head up the student development area here at Rackham Graduate School. We're really pleased to have you join us today, and we hope to see many of you at Rackham's Fall Welcome and Information Fair on August 29th. A little plug there. I also want to add that we held a discussion like this earlier this summer uh, for international students, and a recording of that conversation is also available. So we're going to begin with an opening question, and for this opening question, we're going to ask the students to introduce him or themselves and share their perspectives on this question. And from there, we'll continue with the questions that we have here and the questions that you send a slide. Okay, so let's start. When you think about your first week here at U of M, what were the things you remember most? I'm Kyle Southern. I'm a third year doctoral student in the higher education program uh, here at Michigan, and I'm originally from North Carolina. And I'm thinking about uh, the, those first few days and weeks on campus, what kind of strikes me is that I've been uh, working for several years after my master's program, and then coming here, um, having to adjust back into being a student. It was a bit of a transition in that <clears throat> I was very used to kind of going home at 5 or 6 or 7 o'clock and not having to worry about uh, work anymore, but uh, coming to graduate school, uh, you're in class or doing meetings through the day, and then nighttime is a really a good time to <clears throat> do reading in preparation for the next day. So uh, adjusting to, to that was definitely a transition, but I also was uh, trying to take care of the practical side of life. So where was I going to get my groceries, where would I go to the bank, where would I get my hair cut, all those kinds of things. And so it was good to um, speak with uh, my colleagues, with other students who were a few years ahead of me, with uh, faculty, with other folks who were um, close to me in the School of Education, to get ideas on where to take care of those things. And so that was a process for me of navigating both the transition to academic life, but also <coughs> life in Ann Arbor. Uh, my name is Chukuka Mbagu, and I usually go by Chuki. Uh, I'm a rising third year uh, student in aerospace engineering, and um, I come from California, Riverside, California. I think one of the things that uh, really stuck in my memory uh, the first weeks that I came to the admissions campus was just the amount of people that were here. It was such a lively environment when I, when I stepped on the campus, because from my previous institution, um, this school is actually four times bigger, and at first, I can kind of seem somewhat intimidating, but um, it was really great to see a lot of people just out and about, um, see the great sports culture for the homecoming games and things like that. So it was a really good experience, different experience for me, but something that you know kind of expanded my horizons a little bit. So. My name is Miguel. I'm from Mexico. Um, I'm a second year master in public policy at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. And when I arrived to Narbor, it was surprising for me to find a really warm weather. I was expecting a, a, a dry place or, I don't know, like, I wasn't expecting, like, feeling the jungle and feeling <laughs> hot and, and that there is a lot of nature and that so many places were incredible when I arrived in August. And I think the weather will be pretty similar this year. And, yeah, that was, like, the the... the, the great memory that I have from an album, <laughs> finding something really unexpected for the first week. Hi, my name is Christy Russell, and I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I am a fourth year doctorate of pharmacy student. And what I remember most about coming, or the first few weeks being here at U of M was, um, one, it was busy, because I was trying to transition back into um, school and um, going to classes, taking quizzes, because we had quizzes in the first week of my um, in my program, but also just all the events that were going on that allowed me to get to know people on campus as well as the people in my program. So just getting to know my um, classmates and building new relationships and friendships. Um, my name is Katie. I'm a rising fourth year in the Screen Arts and Cultures PhD program. Um, and what I remember most from my first year, or first couple of weeks here, is I was actually a Michigan undergrad. So I was expecting to come back to the campus and have, like, full mastery. <laughs> <laughs> I remember coming back 
and um, everything was different. Like there were new buildings, there were new people, there were new offices to go to, and feeling really disoriented when I was ready to feel very confident. Um, and I wish that I would have taken time to figure out where my classes were before the first day <laughs> because they were in a whole new building and I had no idea where I was going. Hi everybody, I'm Supraja and I'm from India. I'm a master's student in the financial engineering program and the next semester is going to be my final semester. The first few weeks that I came to uh, University of Michigan, the biggest feeling was uh, I, I kind of felt lost because I was uh, here by the month of June, which is like pretty early and there are not many students around campus. It's a huge campus and you have to find your way. So every turn I took, I forgot which <laughs> route I took. So I would like stop everybody on the way and ask them. Nobody would know, but they would be kind enough to like stop and like use their smartphones and Google <laughs> Maps and direct me in the right way because I did not have a smartphone. That was very helpful. That's the biggest thing I remember. And the first few weeks I did not have housing. Um, so that was a big worry for me at that time. But I did manage to find housing, and the thing is, I I, I uh, got to know a lot of people who still did not have housing. So it's not like if you don't have housing, you don't need to panic. Is what I realized at that point. You get you have choices. It's, it's not like you're <laughs> going to be uh, stuck uh, in a really bad place. So that that was one thing. And then since I'm an international student, never away from have been never away from home, stayed at home all. The, my life. So this was kind of like being alone for the first time. It was nice, but I was uh, homesick as well, a bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then um, meeting so many people from so many different countries, it felt like, oh my God, this is why I came to University of Michigan, you know, to, you know, to experience the diversity. And it's here in Michigan. You brought up some of the things about um, making that transition logistically that first week. What sort of advice would any of you offer about that um, arrival on campus? I, yeah, I, I, I definitely <laughs> have a, a couple things. Uh, housing was also mentioned just earlier, and I think that um, for all students, um, it's really important to get that done early. Depending on your department's um, admissions process and cycle, you know, you can gain your um, admission and ultimately make your decision. Uh, you know, anywhere from April or later. Um, so sometimes I can create some anxiety in terms of whether or not you'll be able to find housing, but the university provides a lot of resources in terms of matching you with uh, roommates and housing and finding things like that. So I think just getting started on that process really early um, is important. And if you're able to visit the campus before you, um, you know, you come here in the fall, um, I think that's really helpful in terms of seeing the place that you're going to be living in or just familiarizing yourself with your classrooms, your department, and all of those things. So just being able to figure out housing or getting an early start, you really don't want to push that too late. But even so, there's a lot of resources for you to, to kind of get that done. So I definitely agree with that. And I also um, thought it was valuable. I got here uh, just a little bit um, before classes started and had a few days without too much on my schedule. And it was helpful to just kind of walk around downtown, mm -hmm. just kind of see where things were, learn kind of the grid, what are the major streets, just kind of get landmarks on not only kind of practical things, but also restaurants or interesting things that look like I want to check them out. Yeah, I would like to just add on to this. Before you, know, before you arrive at University of Michigan, it would be nice to get into touch get in touch with your fellow students because you would learn a lot of unexpected small things that you would you would be you know you would arrive and then you'd find out it would be a surprise but if you like get in touch with your fellow students they would like mention small things like housing this apartments are these apartments are not good maybe you can choose another one so mm -hmm. small stuff which you would not realize but to help you out that would be one thing I what are some other resources so getting in touch with your fellow students, you had sort of hinting towards some helpful resources. What sort of things do you think would be good to check out ahead of time? Yeah, um, definitely in terms of uh, housing, there's Northwood Housing um, website that helps put you in contact with other Northwood students. Um, there's also the University of Michigan off-campus off housing website, which I have found particularly mm -hmm. useful. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered it late, so I think this is great that you guys would hopefully get a kind of advance notice of 
um, this resource because it's really good. It allows you to kind of identify and select you know your particular price range, neighborhood that you want to live in, um, roommates that you would, you know whether it's up to two, three, or four roommates, things like that. So that's really helpful in terms of um, in terms of housing, I would say. And I would say that in terms of off-campus housing, a lot of Ann Arbor leases are for a year, but a lot of times undergraduate students or even graduate students are away on fellowship or they're mm -hmm. studying abroad. So there's often short-term sublets that you can get for a month or two that would give you the chance to sort of move in at least partially and then find out what neighborhood you wanted. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who've successfully taken a short-term sublet and then moved into like a forever home yeah. <laughs> um, a little bit later if they didn't know the city as well. And a lot of times those are posted on the off-campus housing website. Mm -hmm. um, so there are university students that could give you further advice. I'm sure we can um, provide, after the broadcast, links on, on a website for you guys to, to go yeah. check it out. So. Do you guys want to give any thoughts on the different parts of campus, um, sort of how the campus is broken up? Well, uh, like in the road, there are three campuses, one in the north, another in the center of the Ann Arbor, another in the south. In my case, most of my classes are in, in the in central campus, mm -hmm. but I live in the north campus. I have to take one of the buses from the university. There are two major buses systems in Ann Arbor. One is provided by the university and the other is provided by the city. Both of them are free, mm -hmm. but uh, in the university buses, you don't have to identify yourself. Anyone can take the bus without paying a, a lot of it. So I have to take a bus that it's only like 15 minutes or 20 minutes from the place that I take classes. Many people in Narva say, oh, that's too, that's a, a really big distance. You are crazy. You're living <laughs> in a North Campus, and you are taking most of the class in, in Central Campus. But yeah, I, I mean, it's a crazy distance for Ann Arbor, but in most of the big cities in the US, that would be an <laughs> incredible deal. <laughs> only to yeah. one, one bus and t 20 minutes of ride. Yeah. So. Those are, those are like the, the main divisions, and I would suggest, uh, in case you are going to take most of your classes in one of the, of the campuses, that you look something of housing around those places. Yeah. Just to make it easier, but actually it's not a big deal, even if you live far from it. Yeah. I was going to say, a lot of, we talked a lot about housing, but we didn't talk about getting to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. So getting yeah. home and getting to uh, our classes or getting to the li um, library. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think it's always a good deal to look at that bus route, figure out how you're going to get from your house to class ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And also, if you want to drive, like looking up how to get a parking pass ahead of time, because parking can be um, mm -hmm. a challenge on campus. And if you don't want to be late to classes, then it's good to know where you can park ahead of time. Yeah, yeah I'd just like to add on to her statement. In the sense, parking, sometimes some my classmates, they take cars. They park like a mile away and walk, which does not make sense. So it's better to take the, you know, the public transport or the Umish bus buses, mm -hmm. uh, especially during winters. Mm -hmm. it, it would be better to just take buses than, you know, risk having a skid or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are very frequent. Is what I like that. Yeah. Even the city buses during the weekdays are pretty frequent. Yeah. And. Uh, as Miguel said, the both buses are free for the but but for the city bus, if you have an M card, you just need to swipe and it's free. Mm -hmm. uh, for the university buses, you don't need M cards even. Anybody is allowed on the bus. So yeah, your M card, your ID card. Yeah, ID card. card. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, so that's a good advice. When you arrive to Narva, go to get your M card. Yeah, the first <laughs> thing you do is get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anyone have car? Right. I have my card? Right here. Oh, yeah. card. I was seeing card, oh. but thanks yeah. for showing your card. That's yeah. the M card, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I do yeah. have a card. Oh, uh, card. That's okay. <laughs> the M card is great. That is yeah. the M card. That's the M card. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'll get you into uh, performances or discounts. Yeah, you right. get discounts with this card. And uh, your library card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything. You can take your card. Yeah, if you, have the you can card. take printouts. Yeah. And um, I know this is like right in between, but there's, there's like this um, free bus service to Detroit, downtown Detroit. Even that you can access using the M card. You just need to swipe and the ride is free. You can go down to into downtown Detroit, look around, and then come back by the same bus. Use the M card. It's free. Yeah. yeah. I did get a question coming in about what is the best way to get to and from the airport? So that's related ah, to our tra yeah, transportation conversation. As soon as I get here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I get the here? best service I've found is the Michigan Flyer mm -hmm. uh, bus, mm -hmm. which runs from 
uh, downtown um, and also from just the south side of the town by the interstate. Uh, there's a hotel where it picks up called Kensington Court. Mm -hmm. And it leaves maybe about every hour, and it's only $12 uh, each way. In contrast to a, a cab, would probably run you 50 to $60 mm -hmm. um, to get from the airport to here. So I would really recommend the, the Michigan Flyer as a, as a good and reliable service. It's a bus, and right? It, it's a nice coach bus. There's mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. You're just going to hang out. Um, they give you water. It's a nice ride. <laughs> <laughs> they give you water. That's nice. Yes. And that person, Katie, you were going to say. Oh, no, just a second. The Michigan Flyer. Oh, that okay. It's incredibly convenient. It is. <laughs> and they're on time, so. Yeah, and most of them are on time. Yeah. Yeah. Transport. And if you have, like, too many, you know, bags or baggage, which you don't think you can handle on a bus, you can take a cab, but you can try to find somebody who's, like, taking the ride to Ann Arbor at the same time mm -hmm. as you so that you can share the cab ride so it's not that expensive. You don't need to like take the cab for yourself. Could you think? I've also seen people save money by taking the Michigan Flyer and then just a cab from wherever the bus stop is to mm -hmm. their location. So it's more like a $10 yeah. cab ride yeah. instead of a $60 cab ride. Yeah. I arrived here with my family and when we arrived we decided to rent a car and it was a good deal. Also. I mean we we, we rented a car in the in the Detroit airport, mm -hmm. so we just drove like 30 minutes and we left the car in an arbor. I mean, for international students, many times this is an option because you bring a lot of luggage mm -hmm. and you prefer not to take a, take a bus. And even that it's really easy, you prefer mm -hmm. to take some car. And then it's also useful for the first two or three days to have the car in order to buy things to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. kind of I would also like to point out that um, the emission fire runs from around 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. There is limited hours, right. so if you have like a midnight flight or an, you know off peak yeah, exactly. hours, then you can use another service like that. So. Yeah, good suggestion. The taxi is the worst for, idea. For good friends, <laughs> for good friends report. <laughs> right, right. Get all some friends. Someone said, "Can you sure say you had a car?" I do have a car. So but what I, would you like to have a car? Okay. Um, I have a car, but I very rarely take it to campus proper, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I can very rarely park close for anything less than like six or seven dollars. Um, which, if you're coming from New York City, is like, wow, what a deal. <laughs> um, but if you do it three or four days a week, it really adds up. Mm -hmm. um, I do use the car for things like going to the grocery store, mm -hmm. um, but I've also never lived in a place where I couldn't also take the bus. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a lot of friends that don't have cars, um, but I find that since cars are a luxury, the people who have cars are pretty generous with them. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people that either don't have a car in your department that will split like a zip car with you to go to the grocery store and back, or people that will say, like I often say to people in my department that don't have a car, I'm going to the grocery store, do you want me to pick up anything or do you want to come with me? Because it's often just an extra two or three minutes and then they don't have to take you know, all of their stuff on the bus. Hey, okay, what is Zipcar? Zipcar is um, an online private car sharing service where um, I think almost all of the Michigan lots mm -hmm. have Zipcars, um, but you sign up online and then you basically reserve a car and you pay by the hour. Mm -hmm. So if you have just like a short-term one-off ex expense or you really need to get to say like Birmingham for an interview and you don't want to pay for a car the whole time, it's fully insured. And it's not the cheapest thing. Um, it's but if you split it with people or for a one-time thing, right. it's more affordable than renting a car, and it's often more convenient. In Birmingham, Michigan, I yes. Yeah, so. it's not. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. For those who are from Michigan, but I was going to bring right. it up so, because Ann Arbor is in the state of Michigan. Are there be, beyond Michigan, uh, beyond Ann Arbor, what sort of things do you recommend people check out when they get here, when they have a little time to check it out? Well, I um, one of my favorite things to do on the weekend is go to Detroit. I mm -hmm. love going to Detroit, and they have the Eastern Market, which mm -hmm. is the outdoor farmers market on Saturday mornings, and it's beautiful. I mean, there's all kinds of fruit and vegetables, crafts. People are performing, and there's some um, great restaurants right around there mm -hmm. as well. I also recommend that if you can and are able to to go to one of Michigan's beaches. Mm -hmm. I just left um, Tawa City Beach. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was a gorgeous place. So if you can make it up there and get to see that lake, Lake Huron, mm -hmm. you oh, should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, Detroit also it has, um, you know, pro football, pro hockey, pro baseball. Uh, the Detroit Institute of Art is a great uh, art collection. Um, lots of great things to, to do there. Mo you know, movie series, um, concerts. Uh, I agree. And then. Also, towns like um, Kalamazoo or Grand Rapids are not 
too far away, um, those, those are a great day trip as well. I'd like to add on to that. Battle Creek is um, mm -hmm. the world's seeding city, so <laughs> yeah, you, maybe you can check it out. Mm -hmm. I've never done the tourist thing at Battle Creek, <laughs> but I think it's a place to recommend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I go to a lot of state parks actually because in Michigan if you pay for um, a Michigan license plate it often gives you free admission to many state parks um, and so it's like a 15 or 20 minute drive to really good hikes that sometimes it feels good to get out of the city <laughs> um, <laughs> of Ann Arbor <laughs> and see some trees right. but there's also good parks around Ann Arbor. So the Arb um, is sort of an open air botanical garden that it's big enough that you can sort of feel like you got away. Um, I like that quite a bit. I just like to add on to her. In a sense, if you want to get out of the city, just go to the North Campus of University of Michigan. It's mm -hmm. kind of... Oh <laughs> there are deer and... It's, yeah, it's, 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 hello, play. Right. <laughs> you mentioned something about the parks. Yeah, yeah. I have two children, so I spend a lot of time in parks uh, playing with them. And it has been amazing because in the beginning of the summer, we decided to visit all the city parks that are in Ann Arbor, not outside. And we haven't done that yet because there are a lot of places where we can go with the kids and the, to the playground. So there are many activities to do if you have children. And even if you don't have them, many of those parks have an incredible like, row. Uh, you can row them or in the, in the river. Or you can also do a lot of nature stuff and sports. And even if you want to go farther, you can go to Chicago and it's only like three, four hours away. And if you find a deal, you can go and back in, I don't know, 30 bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a really good place to go and to visit if you really want to go to that. Yeah, yeah. In Chicago, the, the train is, is good and it's not yeah. too expensive. You can also take. Uh, mega bus, mega, mega bus, 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 bus uh, that goes there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're all bus services too. And those will go to most of the major cities in Michigan too. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. can take a Greyhound or a mega bus to Kalamazoo or. Sometimes buses are recommended over trains because sometimes trains are slow. Yeah. Buses <laughs> are way faster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we've been talking about a lot of fun stuff, and we'll get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> but we also know that you're coming here for that students are coming here for academic reasons too. So, what kind of advice would you um, share with them? And maybe take it from the point of view is when you came to graduate school, what was surprising to you academically? What sort of things did you discover that you think would be helpful to share to students who are just entering? Um, I just like to point out that. Um, uh, academics is quite rigorous. You should be prepared to give it your best. That's mm -hmm. my uh, uh, that was my thought when I started school here. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can have fun and get good GPAs. You have to work really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to have be prepared. That's it. Mm -hmm. it I mean, it's not mm -hmm. scary. It's, all, it's the reality of grad school, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is tough. So Rick. Uh, Go ahead, please. I was gonna say, I, maybe I have a, I might have a different experience because I'm in a health professional program. Mm -hmm. But um, I, when I came here, I had set a year out from school. From I graduated from graduate school, and then I taught school for a year, and then I came to pharmacy school. And it was the sheer volume of work mm -hmm. was what I, I it's just, I guess what I remember the most. Because right now I'm not in classes, but it was just just the volume of working becoming acclimated to um, having my quizzes and exams um, weekly and every other day. And so if you can eliminate like any type of worry, um, and that for me was getting my lunch ready at night. Like, <laughs> yeah, these are suggestion. little things that can cause you to be stressed out when you have to be someplace or in your class of time on time. Um, getting my lunch ready at night, Getting dressed, uh, get my picking out my clothes at night, knowing where my car keys were, knowing where my um, <laughs> bus pass was. So those type of things, just getting a routine and getting that established. And yeah, that's all important. And then I would just add that um, you can be working on things kind of all the time, and so it's important to just establish, I think, parameters for yourself and to be mindful as you're alluding to of kind of self care, not to think of like. Oh, I'll go exercise. You know, if I have time <laughs> later this week, because you can always talk yourself out of that. Um, if you know you want to, if you know you're 
faith life is important. You need to kind of carve out time for that. And there's, it's just important to keep that holistic perspective. It's kind of easy to lose track of, I think, when you're coming in and getting involved with the work. But you're going to be better at the work if you're also taking care of yourself. And so make sure you're carving out that time, uh, whatever is most valuable for you. Yeah. The best advice I got was to treat my graduate program like a job. Um, because a lot of us are either coming from job um, experience or we really need to make that transition. And feeling like I had working hours and then non-working hours was really helpful for me, not just to make sure that I had self-care, but to make sure that I was using those hours as well as I could. Mm -hmm. um, because there is sort of an expectation and so many different people will tell you that they're reading all of the time or that they're working all of the time that it becomes really easy to imagine that everyone is working always. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> that's not, in some cases that's true, but they might not be as efficient as they could be. And so when I would say that you have two hours to get this amount of reading done, it let me know that I could stop at a certain point, but it also made me more productive in those two hours. Mm -hmm. In the same way that my friends that had jobs knew that they only had a certain amount of time to get that task done, mm -hmm. and so they couldn't be um, taking every meeting, they couldn't be having every lunch, they had to be... Um, sort of strategic about knowing their own limits. What other suggestions do you have like that in terms of um, creating academic habits, um, whether it be yourself or how you reach out to other people? Are there things that suggestions you have? I um, I like to make a task list, and I found that um, that helps me to keep track of everything that is due, um, or even just the things that need to be done in that day. So that it doesn't spill over to like the next day and then I'm like running behind on things. Mm -hmm. So I always make a task list of all the things that have to be done or even just fill out a calendar of assignments that are due or exams that are coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think uh, like she said, you have to pri prioritize a lot because when you during the academic year, you have to concentrate on your uh, uh, academics as well as if you're recruiting, you have to be sure uh, you are at uh, the, the company events that you'd like to work for and if you're doing research you have to prioritize that as well so but then uh, so, uh, like I I know a few people who just go to all these networking events and not concentrate on their uh, classes you shouldn't do that you should strike this balance where you you pick the companies which you really really want to work for um, the classes which are very important the assignments which need to be submitted, you have to juggle a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as, in terms of reaching out to academic s support instructors within your department, some I know are department specific, some are probably more shared, but do you have things that you found really helpful, things you'd recommend? Definitely. I think uh, one of the first things when you arrive on campus that you should do is really get to know your um, department coordinators and mm -hmm. administrators. <laughs> They're absolutely the number one resource that you can for your department or program specific needs. They know all the forms that you need to fill out. They know all the um, how to kind of really interact with the professors and, and your instructors um, and even connect you with other students if you need um, like to work with a study group and things like that. So they're, they're a really good resource. Um, very good for funding. Uh, definitely for uh, doctoral students, you know, we have to go through, uh, you can either come in with a package or you can have like some type of teaching fellowship or other things like that. Uh, they can help you work all those details out, whereas you can sometimes kind of feel overwhelmed. So I think getting to know your uh, your administrators, they're only there to help and they've been there for a, a while and they, they know everything in and out. So getting to know them kind of on a personal level is really important and, you know, they, they definitely go out of their way to help you too. So. Even outside of programs, um, Many people will come in and have a, a statistics uh, sequence or a stats mm -hmm. requirement, and that can be uh, a source of some stress for students. I know it was for me when I came in, but there are regular workshops uh, on campus to uh, help students through those issues. And these are people who are really great the packages and things and help you um, work through those and help you get it. Um, even if you miss a little something in class, they can probably explain it to you in a, a clearer way. And also, um, many students come in with some concerns about uh, writing, and the Sweetland mm -hmm. Writing Center on campus is a really great resource for a lot of students to help them think through how to structure their arguments and um, uh, be clear in their language. So that's been a, a real great resource for a lot of people as well.
I know that um, I am a very fixated on the email that Rackham puts out, and it was every Friday during the school year, and I think it's every month during the summer. Um, but <laughs> I, 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 I told you I am committed to this email. Um, but I found it. I found it really overwhelming when I first got here. How many resources were offered to me? Like I could have made a full time job out of just accessing the resources. And so that digest on Friday was really helpful. Um, for me to see and decide. So I went to workshops on like how to read more quickly, how to f fill out my FAFSA. They have really practical things as well as academic stuff and knowing that there was that one email mm -hmm. that would have most of the important like life skills or academic core skills was really helpful to me to feel like I wasn't Email is prodigious um, and overwhelming. So if you can find ways to be systematic about looking for those things, it really helps sort of cut down on the anxiety of, am I missing this? Or right. is this big important thing happening and I don't know about it? Well, uh, <laughs> just before you jump in real quick, um, so could you talk a little about what Rackham is? Okay. Yes. Put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> you have a good so of it. the way I think about it is that like Rackham is the bigger college office. Um, so when I was an undergrad here, there was like undergraduate office of admissions, there was the undergraduate career center, and now that I'm a graduate student, Rackham is like the umbrella organization that covers many of those um, really important academic skills that aren't necessarily departmental specific. So my departmental administrator is really great for things like what format should my prospectus be or when do I file, but Rackham has really important information about funding deadlines and um, taxes and um, writing and they're also a great like hub that even if they don't, I find that the various offices are all really friendly so even if they don't know the answer, they know where to point you next. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a system that's as large and complicated as Michigan is administratively, like every department has its own administrator, mm -hmm. every school has its own organizational system, Rackham is a way to sort of have one place that you start mm -hmm. and then branch out. Nice. If people used to recommend any other way that they could, uh, I come back. <laughs> like uh, she mentioned, the Rackham emails. So Rackham is uh, organizes a lot of social events for the graduate students as well, like for them to get together and uh, find new people to become friends with. Mm -hmm. So that email con uh, contains not only uh, grant deadlines and uh, professional or. Uh, uh, workshops and such, but also uh, some social events like a, a movie screening or an or an ice cream social or something like that, which I think uh, you should sometimes you should always make a point about going to at least one because you meet so many different people. Mm -hmm. it, it's always fun. Mm -hmm. is what, yeah. in, in my experience, never unscribe unsubscribe from <laughs> unsubscribe from Rackham emails and you get a lot of emails from your different schools as well like mm -hmm. I'm from the College of Engineering and they send me emails like uh, about career uh, career fairs and um, mm -hmm. certain like uh, company uh, uh, events so if you unsubscribe you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff mm -hmm. so never unsubscribe is my opinion. Rackham is also blessed with a really generous uh, endowment mm -hmm. yeah. and there That's I would true. really encourage students who are coming in to visit the Rackham Fellowships uh, webpage and just see the number of different opportunities there are for funding from the school um, mm -hmm. I have a travel grant to go to a conference in my field uh, this fall that comes from Rackham because I've accepted to give a presentation. Uh, this summer I have a spring summer research grant that's funding me for these four months which is great to have and I can work on my independent research. Mm -hmm. uh, there are predoctoral uh, dissert dissertation fellowships. There's a, a lot of resources that you can get money to help pay off student loan interest. <laughs> There's all kinds of little pots of money sitting around Rackham and if you're intentional about looking up where those are and do just a little bit of legwork to fill out the applications, chances are you're going to be able to benefit from one of those um, pools of resources. We, we also are a building. I'm just going to mention that because yeah. we're <laughs> sitting in the Rackham building right now um, <laughs> yes. and it's a beautiful, beautiful building. You can study in it. We hold workshops, professional development workshops as well as social workshops. So I Major speaking events. Major yeah. speaking mm -hmm. events, yes. Um, I know that for me it was a big concern 
about um, so many of the spaces on campus are filled with undergraduate students, mm -hmm. which is great because a lot of them are very bound to the campus and you can see them everywhere. But sometimes <laughs> it's a you little were bit. One not so long ago. I, I was <laughs> not, and I still very often yeah. am mistaken for one. <laughs> um, but I um, found it really helpful to come to Rackham to study because there's something freeing about knowing that undergrads won't come into this building really, um, and knowing that like yeah. if I'm <laughs> um, really frustrated with something or grading, it was a little bit of privacy that I didn't get in my department, which also has an undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling claustrophobic in your department, which sometimes can happen, especially mm -hmm. um, my department's very small, so I find Rackham to be like a welcome oasis. Mm -hmm. The reading rooms are beautiful, they're very Stunning. quiet. Mm -hmm. Stunning. Um, I agree. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I will say that one really important thing in the University of Michigan is to know really different people than you, yes. than you know usually. I mean, most of us are from uh, come from graduate school to get specific skills and to learn specific things. And Rackham is like a place where you can forget about it and you can just remember that there are some people. I don't know, in my case, I study public policy, but it's nice to remember that there are people studying biology or mm -hmm. other kind of, of fields that maybe you are not necessarily concerned about it, but it's always refreshing like to listen to them and seeing that there are many other things outside of you. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> I definitely use Rackham to meet other people because my program isn't under Rackham, mm -hmm. but it still serves, Rackham still can serve me, and mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that it has is that it's allowed me to meet um, different people and uh, people from different disciplines and different departments. Would you what mind mentioning you your um, involvement with an organization? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, so I'm um, the Vice President of Students of Color of Rackham. Um, which is a graduate student organization, of course, um, and it's meant to bring students um, from all disciplines together for social um, and professional academic well-being um, and to provide a safe space where we all can come together, meet, and get whatever things that we need um, from each other. And uh, I guess uh, to yeah, tag along yeah. on that, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm the vice president of Rackham Student Government, which is kind of the student uh, faction representing um, all the schools in Rackham from uh, the four different divisions, humanities, engineering, um, social sciences, and uh, the, the, other one. One. the other one. <laughs> I didn't say that, though. No. Um, so we, uh, we really uh, liaise a lot with, uh, uh, with the Rackham administrators here to provide social events um, for uh, the students, uh, collaborate financially, also putting together um, the uh, professional activities and things like that. So mm -hmm. we really just try and work hand in hand to really bring, represent graduate students' voices and mm -hmm. uh, bring to them events that could be helpful and beneficial to them. Um, we did, this is a great timing actually, we did receive a question, does Rackham host social events since you both are, since some of you were mentioning that, um, go to football games together, etc. was the question. Um, so yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, your particular organizations that you mentioned, but um, can some of you talk about social uh, outlets that you've plugged into maybe via your school or college or your department program, if, you have, if your department or program has a student organization within that that is um, active and getting students together? Uh, I'm a part of uh, GradSuite, that is like the Graduate mm -hmm. Society of Women Engineers. It's uh, pretty popular on North Campus because that's where the College of Engineering mm -hmm. is based. Uh, you can be a part of GradSuite on a country level, but you need to pay for membership. But if you want to be a part of University of Michigan's chapter, you don't need to pay anything. And the good part is that you meet, uh, I call myself a fake engineer because I'm a fi I'm a, actually I'm doing financial mm -hmm. mathematics, it's just called financial engineering. So I get to meet all these uh, women and men, there are men in grad three as well, and they are from nuclear engineering and biomedical engineers. Like when they talk about different things, it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Like one girl, she was talking about uh, nuclear reactors and how uh, Michigan has like one of the biggest, uh, I don't remember the name, <laughs> but it's supposed to be one of the mm -hmm. best reactors or some ex whatever thing. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to know that, you know, Michigan has all this thing. end up into this one space where it's all about your course. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also host uh, fun stuff like pumpkin carving and mm -hmm. apple picking, uh, movie screening, and bar 
popping over yeah so it's fun so yeah. you, and it's not specific to like engineers and um, since it's called women's society of engineers mm -hmm. men that I know men who are a part of society mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. so it's a very interesting place. Yeah. We we co sponsor things with SWE and WISE too. So Rec and does do a lot of co-sponsorship with groups like that. Mm -hmm. Other? Other? Yeah, both my program in higher education and the School of Education have um, social groups that will organize, you know, very similar events or uh, football game tailgates uh, in the fall, uh, but also professional development opportunities. Uh, speakers will come in um, that they'll host. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got. But we can also have a, a chili cook-off, so it's kind of a, a variety of, of programming that um, those two organizations will put together. Yeah, it's the same in public policy. I, I could not name how many organizations are there <laughs> organizing things because, I mean, you can find an event even each, I would say, twice per week or something like that. Yeah. Right, I mean, you can, as you said, there are tailgates or there are a conference or a lunch with a speaker or, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, an afternoon dining with a professor of the faculty. So it's amazing. You can really find a lot of things to do. And, and you have cultural nights as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have cultural nights as well. So if you want to experience different uh, um, cultures, like you have the Malaysian night, and then you have uh, um, Indian uh, festivals that are being mm -hmm. organized. So and. Uh, like I said, those emails mention them in their weekly updates. Mm -hmm. So I I learned a lot of stuff going to these cultural nights. I mean, you have these kind of assumptions about certain people, and it really does break. I mean, these events uh, help you, you know, forget about those. Mm -hmm. Cliches. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I just want to plug um, the University Musical Society. Yeah. So um, UMS is a huge organization on campus, and they bring in and like a, a truly astounding caliber of musicians. Um, and students have access twice a year, once in September and once in December, to the half price ticket sale. So you mm -hmm. can get tickets to literally anything they put on for half price. So that can be balcony seats, or you can pay. So I have seen like world class musicians, mm -hmm. and the prices are cheap enough that you can say, well, like, sure, I will go see an ancient Chinese violin <laughs> symphony. <laughs> and, and it turns out... Or the um, San Francisco Orchestra. Or the yeah, San Francisco um, Philip Glass um, premiered the working rehearsal of Einstein on the Beach. Yeah. I've seen Yo-Yo Ma. I've seen Bluegrass. I've seen amazing things. And it's so accessible. And they're always um, walkable to campus, which right. is really nice. You don't have to go oh, nice. um, into a city to see them. So... Yeah, Carol, you did a riff on on what Ann Arbor's like. Do you do you care to do that again? And I just say that uh, I think that for its size, Ann Arbor tends to punch above its weight. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, that's right. We that's have what you said. Uh, those kind of great cultural aspects here um, that are just a, a great benefit of being part of a place like the University of Michigan, which um, attracts that kind of talent on a regular basis. But we also have the longest running independent film series um, in the United States uh, that happens in March. We have just next week, the Ann Arbor Art Fair will bring something like half a million people through town uh, over the course of a four or five day period. Um, and that brings artists from across the country and around the world to descend on our streets. <laughs> and you can just sort of walk around and and see that and, and appreciate um, those kind of expressions. Um, in a few weeks, I'll be at the Michigan Stadium for uh, the Real Madrid-Manchester United soccer game, yeah. and they're playing games in places like New York, Chicago, Dallas, San Francisco, and Ann Arbor. <laughs> and it's like, which one of these not like the others? And uh, it's just a, a really interesting part about being here and that you have access to these kind of world-class events and you know, what is a, a relatively small but... Um, really vibrant college community. Mm -hmm. And you guys actually hit on a couple things that I want to talk about a little bit more or have you talk about. Uh, UMS, uh, Art Fair, those are unique Ann Arbor things. Let's think about it. Some of the things that you that we think about as common language here but people might need to know ahead of time or even common um, habits and one I'll throw out is 10 after the hour. Mm. Um, Court classes always start at 10 at the hour, so if it's 2 o'clock, it starts at 2.10. That is called Michigan time. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but don't be late for a faculty meeting at, they, they think 2 o'clock on 2 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> so, Only classes start at 
Michigan Times restaurant or, or workshops, online. yeah, mm -hmm. things like that, right? So, what other sort of things do you, if you can sort of think back, were surprises yeah. to you or new to? As not a football or sports person, I'm always amazed at the like the degree to which the city shuts down on Saturdays during the fall. Yeah. It's almost impossible to drive anywhere near that area, which is sort of a problem because there's like a really good Meyer, which is sort of a cheaper <laughs> grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, there's major highway access that way. It's almost unwalkable. Yeah, they've um, literally shut down. The they, they literally will shut down streets. So it's something to be aware of, especially if you live near the stadium, that Saturdays there will be people all over Everywhere. your lawn. <laughs> they will be... They <laughs> um, that it, it's the the population of the city like doubles on mm -hmm. football Saturdays, so um, and it's concentrated in a very small part of campus. You can also see businesses around town no other operating hours. They'll, they'll say except football Saturday, Saturdays. September six, and kind of yeah. go through the home game schedule. So. Uh, it really does kind of overwhelm the place. Yeah. Uh, for Have any of you gone so to see him for Michigan? I'm sorry, I interrupt you. Have any of you seen a Michigan football game? Yeah, I've got all of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and anything you'd like to say to students who haven't experienced that? Uh, in my experience, it was. I mean, I was amazed by the size of the stadium. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, there is the Azteca Stadium, and it's very famous in all over the world because it's mm -hmm. very big. Right. So when I arrived on our, I said, "Oh yeah, the stadium is very big," and I said, "Oh yeah." Course, you know, I know what that and is. then I, I search in Wikipedia and it's bigger than the Stadium. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like so it was it was awesome and it was also incredible to see how the how the town changes in one day. There are many people in the streets and it's not only like drunk guys or, or <laughs> undergrad. There are many kind of people and yeah. they are they are only uh, enjoying the game and even many people in the stadium seems that they are not understanding the game very well, but they are having fun and they are. <laughs> Having an, 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 a, a great time, uh, just sharing the time with the community. So it's it's an amazing experience. And uh, yeah, I would say even if you don't yeah. have any interest in football, just as a sociological experience, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> going to a, a, a cultural athletic event with 112,000 other people, yeah. uh, and knowing that you are part of the largest group of people doing that one particular thing on a given day uh, in the world. <laughs> Is a little. Uh, it's a special uh, thing here, and so I would say to just to give it a try at least one time, if for nothing else, just for the spectacle of all of it. <laughs> and and you see a lot of interesting things happening on football nights. Like uh, I once saw this yeah, one. Careful. <laughs> yeah, 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 undergrad kids wearing just shorts, like late fall super cold night, running mm -hmm. around shouting slogans. Like. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's very interesting. Yeah. So, I would absolutely piggyback off of that and just say if you are. <laughs> remotely interested in football, definitely get season tickets. You've gotten the email by now, I'm sure. Oh. Make sure you get that. Um, it'll save you money in the end. But even if not, uh, you're not a huge football fan, uh, just like Kyle said, make sure you go to at least one. People will let you know what are the biggest games of the of the season. Try and get tickets to those. Um, take back on what you said as well. It's the largest stadium yeah. in all of the U.S. for football. Um, so it is it is one of I would say for the homecoming game, that was my biggest kind of experience when I came to Ann Arbor, um, coming from a school that didn't have as large of a sports culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something to just check out, even yeah. if once. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know, but when, when I finished the game, one people of Ann Arbor told me, like, in 20 years, you won't remember a single lecture of all the grad programs, but you will remember this game. And I think he was right, you know? <laughs> it's, it's an amazing experience. Agree. It's an amazing experience. So. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> so things are defining. It sounds like the uh, musical society is certainly defining the the uh, sports program, particularly the football program. It sounds like what other th sort of things that do you think of as defining um, when you think about Ann Arbor or the University of Michigan? Things that you think, well, this makes this a really cool place. Uh, the eating, uh, uh, I mean, the restaurants out here mm -hmm. are so diverse. A lot of choices. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that would be. A big part of Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. In in case folks who are coming here have not heard, um, winter here can be a bit challenging. <laughs> defining uh, elements. Uh, <laughs> literally defining elements. Uh, but for uh, kind of the the struggles of winter through a good deal of snow and a good deal of, of cold wind, um, that you need to buy a big jacket for. Yeah. Uh, this time of year. And the fall uh, really kind of define 
Ann Arbor for me because it is just an impossibly beautiful place mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to spend these months and to uh, run around town or to go to the Arboretum or to just be on the center of campus, uh, which you should know is called the Diag, <laughs> and see um, kind of changing colors of fall. Um, that's a really uh, special time here. And that, that also adds to, I think, the, the culture around football. It is the half heads at this time of the year where you just kind of uh, feel a special energy about the place where people have come back from the summer and everyone's excited to be here. Uh, and in the wintertime, we kind of hibernate a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but once the spring starts and through the fall, it, it's really a, a great place to be. I, I want to say that, you know, winter gets a bad rap. And I'm from the South, so I'm like, I don't, I don't. <laughs> like the cold but I can appreciate the winter here because just as much as the spring and the summer is beautiful the winter although at the end you might not feel this way is very <laughs> beautiful as well and there's still a lot of things going on during that time um, people like to ski yeah. and um, I've, I've been to like outdoor festivals like in Frankenmuth where they have like this ice thing going on mm -hmm. so there's yeah. things that are still going on like it doesn't just stop there's still lots of things and you can appreciate the beauty of the winter time yeah. as well it's also important to note that as also as a southerner um, mm -hmm. you know if we get two inches of snow well, everything is closed and it uh, but it, everything it's, goes yeah. on here I promise you that bus will be on time and school will be open and <laughs> life goes on so people just dress for it. get some good boots mm -hmm. get a good jacket get a scarf get a hat I think fine. they closed mm -hmm. the, um, we had a snow day One. this year, but it wasn't a snow day, it was like a, it was a cold, cold day. day because yeah. it was severely cold and too cold for um, to have students on campus. And I think that was like the first. In like 50 uh, years. Yeah. 30 years. 1970. Yeah. Early 80s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was really cool. So. <laughs> it was. I will <laughs> say that one of the things that always surprised me after I had been to other universities is how short the break between fall and winter semesters are. Yeah. Um, so the fall semester will run until like sometimes I've had exams on like December 23rd yeah. and oftentimes there's work over the break and it starts right back up again on January 3rd sometimes. Mm -hmm. But there's four months of summer. Mm -hmm. So the, the there's a full four months which is different if you're used to the quarter system or even been a sort of delayed semester. Mm -hmm. So I find that the beginning of the winter term is cold, it's dark, you haven't had much of a rest, so it's more important than it could be at other places where you might get the chance to go home. Mm -hmm. I know a lot mm -hmm. of, um, I have friends that are international students that just don't go home over the break yeah, um, because sure. it is so short. Mm -hmm. So it's an important thing to check um, when you get here to mm -hmm. sort of plan because mm -hmm. I know I've had friends that have booked um, flight tickets home and then had an exam four days later and couldn't make it. So. Um, it's it's an uncommonly short break mm -hmm. in between. And truth in advertising, we have fall semester and winter semester, which right. maybe we might know as spring semester, but yeah. <laughs> we have winter term and then we push spring summer together yes. in that four month period. Right, yeah. right. And uh, she mentioned about you know booking flights in advance. Uh, the prof a lot of professors are um, ready to change their schedules to suit you. I mean, they're not going to do it all the time, but they are willing to accommodate. A lot of professors, um, uh, like uh, my class is 90% international students. A lot of them wanted to go home. And uh, when the professors scheduled the exams way later in the month of December, and when like a bunch of people went and spoke to them, they were willing to reschedule mm -hmm. the exam. So that happened. So it's mm -hmm. not a big problem. It's worth an ask. It's worth it yeah, asking yeah, and working yeah. with your faculty. Um, are there other academic norms that you were surprised by that when you got here? That again, it's hard to think back sometimes. You, you have before. to register for classes. Uh, that kind of can be a bit challenging when you don't understand in the beginning, but then you get the hang of it. And like Chuku said, you always have to be in touch with your coordinators because mm -hmm. they know the best mm -hmm. and they know like which uh, class, um, like the like the same class will be offered three times a week so which would suit your schedule best mm -hmm. so in so there's no time clash between the other the rest of your mm -hmm. courses so you can uh, you you if you have any doubts if you have an established relationship with your coordinator all this becomes nothing at all it's, it's super easy i would add that um i was very confused and remain confused by the, <laughs> the physical uh, the online platform that one uses to register for classes. Uh, 
Wolverine Access, which uh, frankly I find to be uh, rather outdated and unintuitive <laughs> and difficult <laughs> to navigate. So I would say to a new student that if you feel that way when you come in to register for classes, you are not alone. <laughs> and that graduate coordinator in your department um, could be a good resource. And because I just, I know trying to navigate and figure out, am I actually registered? Do I have to I just put it in my backpack? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's, just, it's, 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 it's an odd and, and outdated system that I, I think we should improve. But in the meantime, <laughs> there are plenty of people who have found a way to actually go to class and to sign up for them. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid to ask people uh, or don't feel mm -hmm. like you're really missing something just because the, the system seems odd. And, and you have like the, the course uh, drop deadline mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. after uh, yeah. uh, two weeks. I don't know the exact timeline because I've three never weeks, three, three weeks. weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. yeah, after classes start. So even if you haven't registered for a really important course, you can like personally go, go talk to the professor and he will try his best to accommodate you in his class unless his class is filled to the capacity and there are no seats. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know classes where super popular courses where uh, professors have allowed you to sit in classes and not exactly sit, even stand in classes sometimes. See where they yeah, so up. that they can accommodate yeah. you. So. That's great. I will say that registration is really important because there's a lot of student benefits that are tied to registration. Right. So it's a really important thing in terms of your health insurance. Sometimes mm -hmm. the distinction between are you a part-time student yeah. or a full-time student. So it's a really good question for your department. What constitutes this full-time in our department because there are differences even between programs or between years in my department's case. Mm -hmm. So it's um, as much as your fellow students can often be a resource, um, the requirements change, the, mm -hmm. um, the health insurance can change, and that it's always best with something as important as registration to double check it. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. with the department. And, you're and you've talked about the grad coordinators or the program coordinators, people call them mm -hmm. too, um, important people. We haven't talked a lot about faculty, mentors and advisors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know if anyone wants to talk about advice or suggestions they would get to maximize that relationship. Well, to start off, I think one of the main mindsets you have to, to uh, come into graduate school I'm um, kind of being aware of is that um, not only are you going to be a student um, of the faculty and of the different instructors and professors, but you're also going to be, in many cases, you're doing a research component, right. collaborators and colleagues with them. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge, in my opinion, that's a huge kind of mental stepping stone to, to really get past because that will, having that relationship uh, kind of be collaborative and back and forth will really improve the dynamic, whereas you don't really want it to be a dominant slash subser uh, subservient kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. So um, they, you can, you're obviously going to be learning from them, but they can also learn from you, and you have to be able to understand that you are coming here to make a contribution, and mm -hmm. that they're also working with you to do that. So I think that's really important, just to kind of put yourself into the right state um, when you know, kind of pursuing your graduate degree, um, and then just also, you know, making sure you meet with them weekly, you know, establishing the relationship. Not only not have it not only based on academics, you know, be able to talk to them about social things, you know, sports activities, what they're interested in, how their family's doing. So, really forming the relationship with your advisor, with your faculty um, that you'll be in contact with is, is really important. And actually, to piggyback off of that, I think it's important to realize that not everybody's faculty, like their advisor advisee relationship, looks the same. So, I actually don't discuss much of my personal life with my advisor. Like, got married on the fly, I didn't really tell her um, <laughs> because it felt it wasn't. It just wasn't part of our relationship, and so I know that sometimes it would feel overwhelming if you would hear somebody talk about, oh, I went to drinks with my professor, and we were talking about our kids, and how amazing that was, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, my advisor doesn't even know where I'm from. Like, <laughs> this is a very different, am I doing it wrong? So to realize that different relationships look different, and that it's up to you. Um, for me, it was a really big step to realize that I could have many mentors. Um, I have one official advisor in terms of my dissertation, but I have many mentors. Um, and so some of my mentors are better at other skills. So I do have somebody that I can go to if I have a personal problem. or And I have sort of career advisors, and I have um, but having like Team Katie is more effective <laughs> <laughs> for me. And there's so many. It takes a village. Uh, it does. <laughs> it does take a village. Yeah. And um, many there are many ways to get through a PhD. I know it was one of the big shifts for me realizing that um, in my department everybody 
I thought at times I still feel like everybody but me wants to be a professor and I'm I'm open to that, but I'm not sure that it's exactly what I want. And so it was important to me to start um, reaching out for people that could mentor me in a different career path if that's what I wanted. I want to piggyback off of when you were chief at Katie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I find that it's very easy to establish mentorship here. Um, I, I too, am not sure if the actual practice of pharmacy, clinical practice of pharmacy is something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I wanted to do research and maybe more public um, type of area. And so I have been able to go into the, like the School of Public Health and find mentors there. One of my greatest mentors is a ph physician mm -hmm. um, here. And I have um, mentors and um, one of my other mentors is in dietary sciences. So you are able to get the people that you need. You just have to be a go-getter. Like You have to be active in trying to establish those relationships with people, and a lot of people are open with that. So can I ask you, how does one establish a mm -hmm. mentoring relationship? How do you find these magical people? What well, do you do? I, I use people to find other people. So I <laughs> may find one person, and I, I start talking to them about what I'm interested in, and that person's like, oh, you know, I know somebody who may, you know, be able to help you. And so then they introduced me to somebody else, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I've got made my way around campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I'd like to add a different perspective to this because there's a lot lot of research oriented mm -hmm. stuff, advices. Mm -hmm. I am from a professional uh, co program mm -hmm. as such, so we don't have uh, advices assigned to us. I I'm not even sure if we have like assigned mentors as such, mm -hmm. but we have um, like uh, this set of professors who take classes regularly for us, like each semester they take at least one course for us. So it's important to establish relationships with those professors because they have like professional friends outside as well who can like, they can direct you to them or they can give you like, you know, they can give you professional advice as well because they have experience outside academics as well. And then another big part, um, of your relationship with faculty is you have office, uh, faculty have office hours uh, assigned for each course. So you should make sure that you go to those office hours. It, you, it need not be about uh, the subject as such. You can ask about like the general, um, uh, general area that you're interested in, or maybe you can approach him about a certain idea you have and you want to research more on and you can ask if he can help you give more directions towards it. So that's very important. Office hours are very important. A lot of people know, re religiously write down those office hours, but they never go. I mean, I used to do that as well. But then I've realized the importance of office hours. Yeah. So taking action, going to office hours when they're not necessarily a need of a particular question, but establishing relationships. Are there sorts of things that you can think of for creating those yeah. relationships? That I find about? in general that if you go before whatever your concern is a crisis is the <laughs> best way, that it's very hard to establish long-term sort of relationships with people if the only time you see them is when you're in crisis. <laughs> um, not that your mentor won't be very important to you when you are, are in a crisis, um, or not that crises are all that common. No, <laughs> not, that, not that everybody has multiple crises. Um, it's important to reframe smaller problems away from yeah, crisis yeah. language yeah. Um, because that the language of crisis is pretty rampant. Yeah, um, right. But um, I've found that the um, I am really nervous when I feel like things aren't going well, and so I'm not my best self. Um, and that's not great conditions for me to meet people under. Right. And so the um, speaker series have been important for me. Mm -hmm. I go to different Rackham events and sort of connect with students first and then use that. If the faculty seems intimidating, it's sometimes easier to go through the graduate student that you know already works with that faculty mm -hmm. and ask for, um, you know, could you drop my name? I'd love, and that sort of softens the beach, so to speak. Yes to um, making those connections. So even if you aren't comfortable sort of cold going to office hours, right. um, and there's a lot of people who are willing to give advice about how to navigate those relationships, mm -hmm. um, you just kind of have to be brave enough to ask. Uh, I have a point to add on to that. Like uh, when we were talking about graduates to uh, coordinators and how it's important to establish a personal relationship with your coordinator. Uh, I know a lot of students who like the graduate students are, I mean the coordinators are after them about like filling a survey or like 
you know submitting your resumes on time but a lot of them do it like right like in the last minute they have to be behind those people but when they have something that they need like a, um like this letter that needs to be posted to some company or reference or something they like they go and go talk to the coordinator and think that the coordinator is going to be like you know like that they're going to get the stuff done but when you have like this personal relationship when you're prompt in in replying to their emails they uh it, it it's human nature. They yeah, they're more likely. willing to help you. So it's always important that you don't go, uh, <laughs> like only when you have crisis. A yes. uh, crisis. You should always have this smooth, regular interaction with your faculty and coordinators. I think it's um, just kind of important to note as well that a lot of the methods that we're talking about in terms of forming these relationships are on ground. You would have to be here, but I think you can even try and start forming those by sending an email right now to a mm -hmm. professor or faculty that you're interested in working with. Um, my experience is that they've been uh, very uh, receptive to that, um, responsive as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even if that is not particularly the case, because all faculty and all students and everyone here in the university is busy, because <laughs> everyone's got a lot of things to do, um, I would just say, you know, don't let that be a discouraging factor. Obviously, right. you, just mm -hmm. keep, you just keep going and keep mm -hmm. trying. Sometimes I found that you may have to send a few emails. It's not not to the point where you become annoying, but mm -hmm. just so that you can keep a presence. Because some people, um, they do. Mm -hmm. We all get an overwhelming amount of emails. Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of just drop a follow up email, mm -hmm. a lot of times that does work because mm -hmm. the people check their emails and then they forget. But then if you follow up with them, they remember. Oh, you know what? I need to respond to this student. So. That's important. Like so, my, uh, so I'm just jumping for a second. You had sure. mentioned, Ajuki, about doing um, some before you get here sort of behavior. Are there other things that you guys did before you entered, before you're on ground, as you put, <laughs> before you got here? I took a vacation. Oh, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, I came um, most recently from Nashville and uh, drove up with all my things and just kind of threw everything into my apartment. And I think a day later, just went on like a 10-day vacation. I uh, went to the beach in South Carolina and saw some of my family and saw some of my friends. Not as like a farewell tour, but <laughs> more as a way to um, just kind of reboot. And I you know, just uh, finished um, about three years of, of working. And I just really wanted that time to kind of step away and, and reflect a bit and I'll just kind of, also kind of relax. and kind of recharge my batteries knowing that I was going to be going into um, a pretty intensive transition period and a, and a rigorous program here. And I also wanted to be really hot so that when the cold came I would appreciate that you as well. So uh, I wanted to be just as hot and humid as I could get and so I found it in South Carolina. But um, I thought that was, that was really great just to kind of have a little bit of time. Not everyone's going to have you know, that luxury, but if, if you can carve out um, a little bit of time, I think in August before things really get going around Labor Day, I would really recommend doing that. Yeah, that's important as well. And uh, do you want to go first? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, that's important. And then like checking into minor details like housing, which I never did. And I came here and I had to search for housing. That's important. And then looking up like into your insurance, especially for uh, international students. But in some countries, there's no concept of insurance. Unless you really want to, you take insurance. Otherwise, you don't need insurance. So that's a surprising detail that a lot of them don't, I mean, just flies off their head. You should check into that. And then um, international students, again, I, I'm kind of talking on the perspective of an international student. Uh, make sure you have all the stuff you need, like clothes, uh, if you are... Uh, if you need some medical uh, supplies like medicines, prescriptions that need to be filled, make sure you have it so that you, when you come here, you don't have to like, you know, right. you, you, you're not in a situation where uh, it, it, it's yeah. kind of difficult. Those are great suggestions. And in fact, yeah. I think um, you're backing up some of the things that were said in the international panel. So we'll make yeah. sure we link to that oh, so sure. that we get that out because I think they're very particular things for international students too. You were gonna say yeah, in my case, like was very helpful to contact that person that was studying the same mm -hmm. that I did. Mm -hmm. So I just asked him a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. First, I I felt like I don't know, like sorrow because I said like, oh, I'm just asking 
stupid questions, basic questions, but they are the type of things that everybody are asking themselves. So mm -hmm. he was very helpful for me. He helped me just saying things like, if you take this class and this class and this class, you won't make it. You should take another one because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And that was a very good insight. And I think if you have another question, you could ask another student and he will give you a lot of advice. And I, I came up here a month before school started. So I was here July, well, almost two months before school started. And um, it's not only important to contact people about logistical things like where you're going to live and things like that, but it's also important, I'm sure many of you who moved here, moved here without family. So it's also important to make those social connects. Mm -hmm. So before I came here, I emailed other like minority students in my program mm -hmm. so that we can meet and greet before we got here because I, I mean, I didn't have anybody else mm -hmm. here. And I think that that's important as well. And I think that it's really easy when the school year gets started, especially mm -hmm. the people that you see all the time, your fellow graduate students, like the, my program is really small. There's only 10 of us total. And it was very easy to slip into all school talk all the time. And so mm -hmm. it was important, and we try and do it every year, to have like a day where we talk as humans, like <laughs> <laughs> where we go time. to the beach or we go to the park and like school talk is sort of off limits so that you know who these people are as people. Mm -hmm. um, because it's really easy to lose sight of that, especially when there are things that are really important, like about this class, to recognize that these are people, they have families, they have lives, they like certain music, mm -hmm. and to be able to connect on things that are other than your immediate discipline can be um, really enriching later on. Mm -hmm. uh, this I is off the topic of yeah. things to do in advance, but it's important. <laughs> I have, I have a, a cohort of, of nine people, and you do spend almost all of your waking hours around uh, some people from that cohort, and, but we are all doing different things as well. So. We also make a point of once a month doing a, like a potluck dinner or something, and we appoint a referee because inevitably Somewhere we get into the shop, <laughs> you know, talking shop or about different professors of the class, and that sort of say, we're talking about that. You know, what's the last movie that you saw? Like, Back please talk about anything that's yeah, not this. <laughs> uh, and that those are, are really good community building times too. Yeah, those are really important points, I think, because to be surrounded by your own uh, uh, classmates, it kind of um, you don't get a new perspective and when you meet new people you get oh this is happening <laughs> kind of uh, feeling and um, uh, one more thing about uh, like uh, thing about socializing is that a lot of uh, students tend to stick for example I'm an international student from India and I tend to stick to I've never done that personally but I know a lot of people who tend to stick to people from their own country mm -hmm. and don't mingle. That kind of uh, uh, limits the experience that mm -hmm. Anavar has to offer. We have, we can experience so much diversity, so much new experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think when we do that, we miss out on a lot of, uh, uh, you know, things that we'll remember way later in life. So mm -hmm. it's important to mingle is what I say. So you've mentioned some things you do for fun. Sports, we know that's uh, an UMS. Are there other things you'd say uh, students should really look forward to or great ways that you find our uh, ways to sort of have fun here in Ann Arbor that we haven't talked about? Um, I I am a part of uh, the Ann Arbor Rowing Club, okay. which is not part of the University of Michigan. University of Michigan has a rowing team mm -hmm. as well, but that's I, I've never been a part of it. Uh, I joined this summer, learned to row, and I'm a part of the novice team right now. And uh, I'm actually going to race next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of exciting. I'm no pro, but you know, it's mm -hmm. stuff to do, nice stuff to do. And so, I mean, I'm I'm interning, and then a good break would be to go for a rowing class mm -hmm. in the evening. And I get to meet a lot of different people. So now I get not only to meet students, but you know, people who live lives which are apart from University mm -hmm. of Michigan who like teach at Ann Arbor mm -hmm. schools and work at I signed up for um, Meetup. I don't, it's mm -hmm. a website oh, yeah, and yeah. it has like I get an email every week just telling me like what meetup groups are going mm -hmm. on yeah. and it's like different areas so like food and drink or club or religious affiliations mm -hmm. and so I kind of like peruse that every mm -hmm. um, week to see what's going on and then make my decisions yeah. from there. Yeah, that's good. 
I actually have a writing group that I meet with that meets sort of off campus, and I'm the only one doing academic writing. Actually, everybody else is writing um, science fiction and fantasy novels. <laughs> um, so, But it's sort of nice to have a place where I still feel like I'm working, but it's in a coffee shop and I'm not in the library. Um, and I'll also give a plug for the Ann Arbor libraries. Um, they have a really great library system with great talks and um, authors, and I find it really helpful to read things that aren't for school, um, that yeah, I am, crazy. Yeah, <laughs> crazy time. But um, I had a pretty difficult first year. When I got here, I sort of felt like everybody else was working all of the time, so I needed to work all the time. Mm -hmm. And I used to keep this note, like book full of books that other people referenced, which in the humanities is a pretty big deal. <laughs> and I, and then, so if I had any spare time, I would start reading things on that list, and it got to the point where. I wasn't doing anything else, so um, I really had to sort of stop the summer afterwards and take stock of what I was doing, and so I actually have like a firm cutoff time that I don't do work after mm -hmm. a certain point or on certain days or for certain weeks, mm -hmm. and it makes me like more productive because I'm excited about that vacation, like I want to be able to stop, but it helps me feel like I am a real person because you can very much let your identity be so sort of subsumed under your and that um, it can lead to really great work but sometimes at pretty great costs so finding whatever structures you need to feel a little bit of balance I think that's a very important <laughs> point I think you just had, oh, oh I, I just wanted to uh, mention that you're, you're talking about this um, and we'll definitely get yeah. to your point um, Everyone around you is working very hard. You're at Michigan, the best and the brightest. Yeah. Um, leaders and best. Leaders, leaders and best. best. <laughs> leaders and best. Sorry. Um, so I just I wanted to hear from other people about how that realization came about for you, and was that you know how did you manage that? Because it, it I think it can be a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. That was exactly what I was going to add on oh, to. Oh, nice. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I mean, because it's it's a kind of blow on your self-confidence in the sense like, uh, you know, uh, you constantly think that people are better than you. You're not doing your best. You're not putting your best foot forward. And, you know, it kind of, uh, it goes to a point that the, instead of focusing on what's important, it's the fears that you focus on. Oh my God, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. So you should think, uh, um, that four point GPA is not the only thing you're here for. You're here for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should focus on all, you should have this right balance. And you should always not uh, be confident about your abilities. It, it, you might not get the best grade in your class, but it does not mean that you have no skills at all. You have some other skills which are way better than the others in your class. So you should capitalize on your skills, on your plus points. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that when you do that, you kind of enjoy your entire experience. It's not like this whole depressing stretch. Like, um, <laughs> like she said, uh, my first year was very difficult in the sense I was thinking, oh my god, I'm such a loser. I don't know anything about this subject. And math was really difficult for me, though I did an undergrad degree mm -hmm. in math. Math here is really difficult, but uh, but then I now I understand that now I'm I might not be good at math, but I'm really good at business courses and uh, uh, my communication skills are good. So I should concentrate on those so that I can like going forward I do better. Mm -hmm. What I oh, go ahead. No, there's um it's kind of reiterating some of the points, but the, there's a name or a term for this. It's called imposter syndrome, <laughs> and I think it's prevalent at any higher education institution. Um, and it's just something that you really need to kind of just step back, breathe, and say, you know, everyone has some type of struggle at some point. You know, mm -hmm. graduate school is, is a sine wave that goes up and down. There are high points, there are difficult <laughs> points, but at the end of it, you know, it's Always, you're still here. You're still here, and it's you know you're working towards a degree, just like everyone else. So it's just important to keep that perspective. You know, anytime you start to feel overwhelmed, which you will at some point in your graduate career, but it is not the end of the world. You um, you should have a support group that you can go to um, to discuss these things, get yourself out of a funk, and keep going. And you know, if you have that there, um, it, it's 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 only temporary. Yeah. You know, what I've so. what I've told new students coming in is that. Um, you know that our faculty people here are, are very smart and insightful, and so I say if you're on an admissions committee, they don't make mistakes. Like everyone who's here belongs here and deserves to be here and has something to offer. Um, and I also advise them to, 
one thing that I've found helpful is when I have those kind of overwhelming moments, I um, I go back and look up my application to come here. <laughs> oh, and I read my <laughs> statement of purpose <laughs> and my personal statement, and I remind myself of <laughs> why did I get into this? <laughs> and, and every time I read it, I just sort of, oh right, I came for those three things, and I'm doing that, and I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job, and I'm still here, and let me just stay focused on uh, my original motivation. Sometimes you can kind of lose sight of that and kind of the mix of things that are, you're being um, asked to do. Um, but to go back and revisit kind of your foundational principles for this whole enterprise is really important too. Yeah, and also I think like graduate school is what you, I mean, you can get from the graduate school what you want. but mm -hmm. And you have to work hard and you have to work with your colleagues and you have to do your best and then see that another classmate got a better grade and that's fine. If you get what you want and if you get the skills that you are needed to in order to improve your life, in order to improve your abilities for the future, it's fine. I mean, it depends up to you what kind of resource or what kind of objective you want to get from here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, getting an A plus is not always important. It's more important to really learn what it's. Yeah, I, I, there, Sorry, I go, ahead, say, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Christine and Kyle, because you had yeah, something you had suggested last time that was real helpful. Oh, I was going to say that um, it's hard sometimes when you find yourself studying and not getting the returns back on your studying. So you may invest, you know, several hours into studying for an exam or, um, you know, writing a paper or something of that nature, and then you don't get the grade that you anticipate getting. And um, I know my program is very competitive. It sometimes can be competitive amongst each other, and I, I always have to remind myself, and you all may have read this before in um, a book called The Four Agreements, mm -hmm. and it's like um, one of the statements was to always do your best, and I always have to remind myself to just do my best, and my best does not look like everybody else's best, mm -hmm. but I know that I did what I could, and it kind of um, released the stress. Mm -hmm. of feeling like I'm not doing as good as everybody else because I'm doing what I can do. And I know that my, as somebody already said, um, what I do um, may be better than what somebody else can do as, for their skill set, but then they have something that's better for them, you know, that they can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, true. So you had talked about the reading mode. One time you had shared that. I don't know if you're willing to share that approach you take because I think it helps people understand the realities. Well, uh, and I can only speak for for my own program, but I imagine that, particularly in the social sciences, that um, many are like it, and that we have a, a statistics uh, sequence that we go through, but there are also courses that um, are much more content-based for, in my case, higher education, and we, we can look at a syllabus, and there are far more pages mm -hmm. uh, for a week of reading uh, than you think are, are feasible uh, to get through, and you're right, and so <laughs> I think over the really the first year, you need to kind of figure out uh, the best way for you to read and the best way for you to have things to contribute to your colleagues. And I think the way that I broke it down when we last spoke was to say if there are six pretty dense articles that I'm expected to read for a course, I'm, I'm probably going to really focus on three of them and take a lot of notes and think them through and, and think about connections across them. And then on two of them, I'll do, uh, I'll, I'll read through them. I probably won't uh, go as in-depth and spend quite as much time with them. And then one, you know, I'll know what it's about. <laughs> and uh, I'll um, have a few marginal notes. Uh, and as you kind of get a sense of what's in front of you, you can say, kind of, these are the things that I'm really most passionate about and most interested in. These couple of things seem relevant. And this, uh, I'm not sure is going to be that help one getting me what, where I want to know, but I know that someone will really care a lot about this and help me understand it better. Mm -hmm. And if you really invest yourself in those three, and then you have a good working knowledge of two, then you have one where you just kind of take the hit, <laughs> that really helps you, I think, kind of you know, move through. So you don't think that you need to go through all 500 pages or whatever that is and fill them with red ink, with all your notes and everything you ever learned. and Things you're ever going to have time, even in a three-hour class session, to get through that. Not that it's all about you know, performing in class. It's about identifying uh, what are the most important parts of this week for you to help meet your own learning objectives, mm -hmm. and where you can also contribute to the educational environment, and to not um, 
kind of ruin yourself trying to be all things every day um, because that will burn you out real quick. I do just want to point out yeah, that like there's so. there's the imposter syndrome that I think almost everybody feels at certain points and then there's also like legitimate mental health concerns um, and one of the great things about this campus is that there's an amazing mental health network um, through various services there's one called CATS um, that's sort of in what the union um, the counseling, counseling and psychological services um, where you can walk in at any time and sort of speak to someone on sort of like a right now basis or a maybe I can wait on next week basis. There's also a site clinic um, closer to this end of campus that you can see and I actually was in a dissertation support group that was less like therapy and more like here are some of the problems that people have focusing. It was sort of an eight week um, how do I get through this massive beast of a thing called dissertation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from like a mental health perspective mm -hmm. and it was really freeing for me to realize that um, everybody felt what I was feeling to some degree but there were people that were feeling what I was feeling to the degree I was and that there was both help for me and people who understood that. Mm -hmm. So um, there's not, most everybody in graduate school um, at Michigan understands that this is a high pressure, high stress situation and that not everybody's um, ready to jump into that right away and mm -hmm. that there's going to be points where you might need more help than other times and that there's a network already in place for you here. You are not the first one to and sit at home and need help. <laughs> thanks for bringing that, Kate. There are a number of things. You mentioned Sweetland right at the beginning, writing yeah. support, mm -hmm. mental health support, um, statistical support, actually mm -hmm. right here at Rackham. There are a lot of different things that um, you will be made aware of when you get here. We'll also have links to that. At, and at Fall um, Welcome, there'll be a lot of uh, representatives from those organizations here, too, so you can get an overview. For sure. I think that's one of the, um, the things that a lot of students mention about U of M proper. It's that there, there are so many resources here, mm -hmm. so there's, there seems to be almost something to support your every need. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, so I think it's, it's good to know that they're there, but it's also good to know that it's okay to take advantage of resources. Right. I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm you hoping should. you would agree with that, um, because that's what they're there for. So um, yeah, we'll definitely have some links in this um, transcript. Yeah. So we're getting to the end of our time. Am I accurate? Yes. Okay, so <laughs> right. The yeah. clock matches your clock. Um, a couple things that had come up when we were talking about doing this call, just because to sort of shake it out, so we'll talk about it. Some of the, the things that you'll hear when you get here, like the Diag, um, the big house uh, is our football stadium. Um, is anyone willing to share what this means? Does anyone know? Native, right? If you're from Michigan, so um, people will use this to orient you within the state. Um, pros <laughs> will use a double because they don't want to um, forget the Upper Peninsula. But for instance, like if I were to tell people where I'm from, I say like I'm from here, just outside of Detroit. I go to school here. My family is from up here. Because the state of Michigan because the state of like Michigan <laughs> is a hand. A mitten. Um, a mitten. So when people yeah. will say like, oh yeah, it's in Kalamazoo, they'll almost like gesture to their hand without thinking about it, that that's sort of a thing. Um, <laughs> I just found out yesterday. I just, you I didn't realize it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. what we were talking yesterday. Um, any other sorts of things that you think uh, they'll be fresh off the, the train bus flight and they and it might be helpful to know? Well, uh, one of the first things that somebody told me when I come to campus, there's a lot of uh, M, the M, Michigan M. Oh, yes. Plastered around campus and on the ground and little uh, plaques and everything. Apparently, you're not supposed to step on them before your first exam. So, <laughs> beware, so beware. Oh, my God. I just, <laughs> yeah. But there is a way to break that curse if you accidentally do it. So, uh, um, <laughs> it involves running between Rackham and the undergraduate library before the clock strikes 12. Oh, my God. Which means you have to do it at noon. Um, so, I'm sorry. So I guess just avoid it unless yeah. you're but a really fast sprinter. Fresh off the, the plane, uh, you might also might hear about uh, Ipsy and wonder if that's a real word. And that is, uh, that's true. <laughs> it's, it's not, not but it is uh, shorthand for the town next door to us, uh, Ypsilanti, uh, which is home to Eastern Michigan University. Um, and it's a little odd that we're the University of Michigan and just 10 miles down the road is yeah. Eastern Michigan University. Um, but uh, I would also say that uh, downtown Ipsy is also a good place, cool to place to kind of get out of Ann Arbor and go mm -hmm. and yeah. try some, some different things. It's a different vibe. 
yeah. uh, there, but it's a, it's a good place as well. Yeah, yeah, and um, we have a lot of colleges around Ann Arbor. University of Michigan is not the only university mm-hmm. in town. We have community colleges mm-hmm. and small law colleges mm-hmm. around. Um, and there's this Washna Community College, which offers a lot of uh, courses about practical skills. Like I know this um, friend of mine who took motorbiking classes. He took classes for two week, two two days, and then he got the license for motorbiking. Nice. So, you know, you can find. Things There's like things. that. Yeah, they've been right between uh, Eastern and Michigan. So yeah, you know, yeah. Right in between. And we are Washtenaw County. Uh, yeah. That's so a, yeah. Yeah, a mouthful. And we're in the Eastern time zone. I'm just going to say yeah. that people always question that. <laughs> so true. depending where you're coming from. And the mall is towards the south, uh, beyond the South University. I, I think it's called, it's, no, I don't think. It is the Ma- Briarwood Mall, and it's like the biggest mall around Ann Arbor. Mm-hmm. It has more stuff you need. There's a lot of shit. I'd I'd also like to add um, the league and the union refer to (laughs) the Michigan league and the Michigan union. Yeah. (laughs) Um, League union. Yeah. (laughs) Well, they're two different buildings. I mean, you can probably explain it a little better because I haven't, I've only been to them like two or three times. Yeah. So the Michigan union has, um, both of them are like big buildings with gathering spaces, with meeting spaces, with ballroom. They also always have fast food in the basement. Um, so, <laughs> um, so if you're very hungry, but the league um, is the one that was only open for women, I think. So originally the union was for men only. And so they built the league so that ladies could congregate. Um, so I feel a special affinity to the yeah, league. It's, it's beautiful. Um, but they're both, there as well. they're both, um, the, the, the speech that founded the Peace Corps was given on the steps of the Michigan Union by yeah. John F. Kennedy. Um, so there's a lot of cool history yeah. around the buildings. Yeah. Um, I would recommend that actually they don't do an orientation tour for grad students, but there's um, tours available through the admissions office. Yeah. And I've seen people like actually like tag on to like campus day tours <laughs> yeah. just to get a sense because there's a lot of history of the campus that you don't get any other way. Yeah. So if there's a chance to take a campus tour, I would say do it. So you can learn about the curse. I'll, I'll quickly toss in that uh, we have a new president uh, who's yeah. coming uh, in. Yes, uh, thank president you. President Coleman uh, just retired from that position, and just our new president um, Schlissel uh, mm-hmm. is arriving, and uh, we'll have a big event here on September 5th, which is his inauguration, mm-hmm. and there will be hundreds of uh, academic officials from across the country and around the world who will uh, come here uh, for that event. And that will be a, a ticketed event, but I think that will be also open for students and everyone else in the auto, main auditorium on Campus Hill. And a big, big celebration for that. So that will be um, kind of an historic moment for the university, mm-hmm. uh, just our first week of class back. Thank you. It's a beautiful way to, to end <laughs> It is. It's very nice. Mm-hmm. And we are at our time. So maybe we could uh, end with something that you probably hear a little bit, especially if you go to a football game, is go blue. <laughs> if, I, if we could say goodbye to everyone by saying go blue, I would appreciate it. So on the count of three, one, two, three, go, go blue. blue. We'll see you soon.